How well did it get? Because I hear stories, obviously, we've had a couple of podcasts now, uh, things like uh, DJ Prime Cuts in an airport and... <laughs> DJ. Oh, no. oh God! Oh, like how? how, how yeah. You know, if you were to really epitomise to what to the degree of rock star it became, tell me the most wildest story that oh, even now you say to yourself, "Shit, did I really do that?" Killer, killer, podcast. Killer, killer, official. Com. <laughs> you need the Kellervision app. Twenty four seven mini documentaries, podcasts, live shows, DJ live streams, top fives, subscription packages, plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports. Download it from the App Store for free today. Beatbox created. Killer, killer. And we need to talk about world music and street culture. Killer, killer podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller Podcast, live and direct, Central London. Or as central as you need to be, should be, could be, or want to be, anywhere else, you're just wasting your time. It's too much traffic, man. Um, wishing everyone a good morning. Big shout out to graffitikings.co.uk. Hold tight to every regulars. I've got the uh, Kellervision app, free download, iPhone, Android, not dealers. That's sporting art business. Uh, inside the house. Not only have we got a really dear friend of mine, I ain't going to waste no more time into my worms. Make some noise, scratch burbers, prime cuts. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely to be here, man. Really nice to be here. Wow, we made it. We yeah, made it. finally. <laughs> we made it. We made it. How you been? I'm all right. I'm all right. A little bit squiffy from last night, but um, celebrating Cult 45 sort of on the mend and uh, playing at a little gallery spot in Camden for um, PIC. Oh, top PIC. Fun, but, um, and Cult yeah. 45, man. That's a, somebody I'd love to on the podcast one day. That's... Oh, make it happen, man. I'm going to go and see him next week. So, yeah, we had a good long chat for about an hour yesterday. And then um, I, I, I celebrated with about a, a, a few too many beers. So. <laughs> Big shout out Cult 45. Big <laughs> shout out PIC. Yeah, when yeah. I did see the Insta stories, I thought to myself, Hold on, quick send him a text message. <laughs> what time tomorrow are you going to be here? Yeah, I could see it was going to get wavy pretty quickly. It was a good night. Yeah, me and Dexter spinning some tunes. It was wicked. No, Dexter from yeah. Brotherhood. Big yeah, shout, Dexter. Was, uh, yeah. Jeez, God, Big up. Listen, hold on. Let's just break for a second because I forget, you know, I've known you for the great, greater portion of my musical life. Um, and you're so well deeply connected in the hip hop thing from the ju- I mean these names that you're throwing out that we never crossed paths with these characters in our, in the time I was you know I've been friends with you but these are people that you've got you've got a life yeah, of man. lives man I mean I've known I mean I've known Colt since maybe 87 and around that time we were just the little runts at, at Covent but we were there you know we we, we would hang out there with me and uh, Kiss K who I've known again since like, you know, 87. Come on, you were at Covent. Um, you were at Covent. That, that, that was the year I got the name Prime Cuts from Rob Euro, gave me the name Prime Cuts in 1987. So I've had that name. In Covent? This was this around the, Yeah, we would go, we would go there. We weren't like the main players, we were just little kids. Mm, mm. But um, we were there. We would go up there on Charing Cross and, the, you know, be around those kind of eating spots, absorbing it, you know, experiencing wow. it. Um, watching people dance and the artwork and people sharing, you know, showing books and stuff. It's, you know, I was never really in the graffiti thing myself, but I was a fan of it, you know. And it was all around you, wasn't it? Mm, yeah, I mean, I was a youth, youth culture at the time for that, you know, that growing up from like 11 to 16. It was mm. just it was just that, dancing, art, music. How many people were there at Covent Garden? Because for those of you that aren't in the know, Covent Garden in its, in its prime was the... the it was the epicenter of street culture of its of its totally. era. Totally, I mean, it was a meeting spot, but we 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 kind of caught it at the tail end of it happening. You know, eighty eight, you know, eighty seven, eighty eight. It had been going strong since the early eighties. So we we only really kind of experienced the last the last few years of it. Um, and kind of half growing up in Kent and half growing up in London, I had links to people in sort of Stratford and Plasto, mm. and that was who I'd go to Covent Garden with, like Martin Gaspard and. Rob Euro, mm. uh, and, got, and I actually met Colt in Gravesend um, in, in uh, '87 around that sort of time. Um, and knew Arrow from from that sort of period of time as well. Tight Arrow, yeah. And uh, Cell One, you know, we ended up going forming the Gutter Snipes, Snipes and yeah. stuff, yeah. And this is where and, I kind and, of... and first rate it was, it was Blob at the time. Mm. Yeah, known those guys forever. He, he was uh, what DJ name was Blob. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, his DJ name was Blob from maybe 86 to, 
I think when he changed his name to first rate, maybe around 1990, 1991. My mind's blown. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was going to be one of these ones. <laughs> I just knew it. And uh, yeah, and random. I've known random since 1990 because we both did the DMCs in 1990. I was 17 and I think he was 18. 17 year old yeah. prime cuts. What was going through your head at 17 doing the DMCs? <laughs> yeah, terrifying. I remember be- being in the Slammer, this nightclub where they had the region, where it was the region, it was like a heat. Back then they had a heat and then you go to a regional if you qualified at the heat and me and the Edge qualified at the Slammer. But I remember being you know, just in, in the club and looking at the turntables set up and just thinking, shit, man, I got, I'm going to be up there in a minute. What on earth? Madder as well from Son of Noise. He was involved in, the, in that competition. Old time Madder. So all the Son of Noise was there. Mm. Um, yeah, mad. And uh, yeah, at the edge, I uh, got first place, I got second. We ended up in Chippenham at Gold Diggers doing the regional. And um, Reckless, who went on to become the UK champion, won, won that heat. Yeah. <clears throat> and... Dom random comes second. He was reading a magazine. It was that routine where he read the magazine in a mix. <laughs> Caned me by reading a mag. That's uh, so sick. And I come, I come third, so I missed out the UK finals just by that much. Just by a uh, yeah. by a crowd pleaser. Yeah. <laughs> Them damn crowd crowd pleasers. <laughs> but uh, good times, man. Yeah, she rockers with the judges that night. I remember. Man. Yeah. You, it, I, I think. Let's let's really go go this deep into it because the way you're talking now, we're talking like some really, really, really young prime cuts. Mm, yeah, seventeen in nineteen ninety. So that's it, it, that is, that's a lot for people to take on. But more so me personally because knowing you for as long as I have and knowing that that's almost like when I met you, is like you were over half of your year in in hip hop. Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> crazy. And to think that you created this legacy that's kind of it, it, it just keeps moving and you, but you started so young yeah I mean I got the decks in, in 88 when I was 16 but I've been scratching since say 85 is when I first started getting into scratching after sort of discovering the music and scratching via the dancing really because I was into dancing and um, who, who was your favourite DJs that were aspiring to make you in 85 uh, DJ Cheese a guy called Cutmaster DC um, Mr. Mix from Two Live Crew. The, I used Ooh. to I used to air scratch to the B side of what I like because and even now it's still, it does me every mm-hmm. time that record. It's just an eight oh eight and some cutting. It's so good. But I sort of just obsessed with it. Became really obsessed with scratching. Um, didn't get Dex until eighty eight and then went in for the DMCs in January nineteen ninety. But it wasn't like it. You, you know, you weren't on a path to a career. This was just what you did. Mm. You didn't think you know, like no, that. No, no, no. There wasn't. There wasn't like a. There was no kind of vision to it. It was just like you're going for the battle and, and, and it's just for the battle's sake. It is just what you did. Mm. And because of the wealth of creative opportunity with Graf, with B-Boy and with MC and that culture and everything, you, you could pretty much change, choose a lane and change a lane yeah. whenever you wanted. <laughs> yeah, there were many people who did, you know, did everything really well. But um, I was into the dance and I wasn't the greatest dancer, but when... When I caught the scratching thing, it re- that resonated with me, and it was like I'd be at a youth, you know, the local youth club, cutting on the little disco set, mm. and, and there'd be like older lads who were like nineteen, and I'd be getting like respect from yeah. these older kids. Oh. And you're like, yeah, this is this, uh, 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 this is it, this yeah, is yeah. it, this is it, this is what I should be doing. I think I'm onto something here. I'm not getting <laughs> beats. This is good. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's funny what things are a catalyst, isn't it, to make mm. you get to make you progress. See, if it's not girls, it's the fear of um, failing to your peers, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's that just that B-boy ethic of wanting to just get as good as you can be. And, mm. you know, the, with the DMC competition, there was a vehicle there for people to sort of show their wares, even though there wasn't necessarily like a, a, a DJ circuit that you could go on to afterwards. It was still a, a mm. you know... There was a mechanism to get your name out there. And big up Tony as well, Tony Prince, for that. He's been on the podcast and big up Tony. I mean, what a legend. Whoa. Yeah, the whole Prince family, very, very, yeah. Yeah, very, really good people. Um, when I had to, <laughs> I shouldn't tell this story, but I'm going to tell it. Yes. <laughs> when I, I, had to fa- I had to fabricate a reason for, for Vegas not to be able to do a tour of Japan with Banksy. So Vegas, Tony got a gig with Banksy in Japan like early on in, in Banksy's career. We were, we were ma- managed by Timebomb based in Bristol and they right. also managed Banksy. Right. 
So Steve has kind of commissioned time to go on this tour. And the morning of the flights, Tone's rung me. He's like, you've got, you got to just get me out of this, man. I can't go. I think he'd had an argument with his missus or something. Sorry, Tone. <laughs> and I've put, I've put the phone down. And I'm like, Fuck, what can I... What's like, what, what's watertight? So I've, 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 I had to call the agent. So look, Tone's like, he's been really, you know, he's been really cane in it. And he's, had a, he's kind of had a nervous breakdown. And this... This information obviously filtered out to a lot of people. I had uh, Christine Prince ring me up saying, "Look, we've heard about we've heard about Tony, and he can come and stay at our country house." No and I was like, "Wow, what, what a lovely dance. thing!" I felt like complete bullshit. Yeah. but I was like, "Oh, that Did, is, does Tony know. and him know about that?" No, they, right, they, 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 they do now. Sorry, <laughs> sorry too. <laughs> I knew it. I did. But I thought it was just such a sweet thing of like, you know, you, if he needs to get out of, out, out of London and clear his head and that stuff. He's the coolest. That's very Elton yeah. John of them, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, you've known Tony Fowler? Oh, man. Um, I was aware of Tony before I really knew him. He was like one of the dudes who worked in Bongo and Soul Jazz. So when I was going in Soul Jazz, maybe... 92, 93, he was, he was working there. I mm. think he was doing like a Saturday gig there. And then he was obviously in, in, in bongos. Like a, I, I, I always associated him as, as being part of that, you know, that team and really being into his jazz. And then finding out that he was into scratching, it was like, yeah, oh man, I had no idea. It was really, really surprising. Mind and blowing. then, you know, then he, he, he had the idea of putting together the crew. Um, and I was initially like, nah, you know, back then quite egotistical and thinking, you know, if it, but, but, why, why do I want to? Why do I want to join them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> but it was also because at the time, you know, you, you sort of drift into this thing and drift out. I was kind of, I had a job in in Soho and was working as an editor, so I had a kind of career thing happening. So Jeez, it was also yeah. like, you know, can I sacrifice time to get involved in this? And then we'd we'd meet at the shop. And it started to gain some momentum and it started to become, it just naturally happened. And it was, yeah, a really exciting time for, for that kind of aspect of the culture because mm -hmm. there was all these new techniques coming to the front and it's, and the technology had just leapt on with the Vestax mixers. So you had faders that could be manipulated and didn't break immediately. Mm -hmm. So you had this like new. The whole thing just got a really big push, and we were there. You know, we were the, the, time, the timing of it was. We were really lucky in, mm. in a lot of ways. You know, the, the media were interested in it. The formation of the crew happened just at that right time. Mm. You know, being voted DJs of the year by the face mm. before we'd really done anything. We got that for just existing. <laughs> and the crew that we're talking about here is the Scratch Perverts, which. World DMC, I'm very proud to say I'm a part of it. Uh, and uh, the other, what, seven-man crew, but four primary, primary four figures. Yeah. That, that then turned into a three, uh, but prior to that it was eight. Um, and, yeah, a tour de force. Curiously, though, what was your, what was your prospective uh, future job role? What were you doing in Soho? What was your, what was your plan? Um, well, I... I I trained as an engineer, electronic, electrical engineer, and I, I didn't really enjoy the gig. So I went back into further education at a place called Ravensbourne School mm. of TV and studied television studios systems engineering. And off of that, you kind of, it was such a vocational gig that you, you were pretty much guaranteed a job. Mm. So I got a job at this place called Paul Miller Post Production. Um, I'll type Paul. <sighs> <laughs> that, that's, that's a finger sign that's, for those that that's, are listening that's for you Paul <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and mm. yeah he was he, that was a difficult first gig to get I worked there for maybe 18 months and this thought fuck, fuck this, this, fuck this do, fucking yeah. shit and just decided yeah, f yeah I'm like 25 at the time I don't want to get to the ripe old age of 30 <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> thinking you know I could have given the DJ thing a, a go Jaded. so yeah, so just thought, right, I'm going to, you know, leave, have to leave the job and, and go for it. Um, so in December 97, I decided to get myself sacked. Um, How did you do this? Paul wouldn't sack me because Paul's an egotistical maniac and he just promoted me to be head of CTA, the Central Technical Area, by 
sack him, it was almost like an admission of him making a mistake. So he, uh, I, and I let everyone know in the company, look, I'm going to do this. It was like a running joke with everyone turning up late. Just, you know. And time and time again, he didn't sack me. And then we were, I was being reprimanded for something. I can't remember what it was. I was sitting in his office, he's bollocking me for something. And um, I asked for a pay rise and he sacked me immediately. <laughs> <laughs> All that time trying to knock him down by being late to shit. And was, Can you get a pay right out the fucking And he was door. like, yeah, I don't think there's a position in this company for you anymore. And I was like, yes. <laughs> he was like, well, you, you wanted me to sack you? Yes, I've got to go and sign on now. Yeah. No, there's no, there is no like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this isn't, he, he thought I was mad. He was like, you know, there's no way you're going to succeed. You're making You'll a huge never make mistake. It. Yeah. I'll see it. I'll yeah, see yeah. you to the, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It's door slams. <sighs> and what, so was this, this the transitional point of Scratch Purpose or was there, a, was it, because I don't remember, in f- fairness and respectfully, I don't, I don't, I remember Prime Cuts, the name, and obviously Gutter Snipes. That was one of the main key. But I don't remember Prime Cuts going out as a DJ on his own entirely. I, I remember it was a quite a crew. He was a bad, he, he, you were accompaniment to Gutter Snipes. That's how I kind of came into the form. Yeah, I mean, I used to gig, I used to do a, like a dance hall um, club, it was one of the first gigs I ever used to um, play. That was that was sort of ninety one, ninety two, mm. and around the same time I would play um, at the Red Line in Northfleet, which is where the Slammer was based. Mm, gotcha. The Slammer was like a a breeding ground for some of the most amazing DJ talent at the time. So, okay, you Brown had Cuts, come on. you know you had Tim Westwood, Norman Jay, Giles Peterson, um, Pete Tong, Nicky Holloway, all these. Guys what? who were quite young dudes at the time. So we're talking, and I, I snuck into that venue in 87 when I was 15 to see CJ McIntosh. And I'll never forget he was cutting, he had that sort of side of platter cutting thing. I managed yeah. to get myself on stage. I was still I was mad underage. But it was, um, it was an incredible spot. And I, I played there quite a lot um, at the Brooklyn Nights and Living Easy and things at Craig and Marcus, mm. who were um, like local DJs, and a guy called Carl who had an incredible record collection. So I was playing out, but it wasn't like, you know, you weren't, a, these were like 40, 50 quidders. It was, mm. You know, it was that kind of gig. Um, but when when the, the, the thing with the Scratch Perverse was happening, from the very beginning, we were, we were already sort of seeped in club culture and were playing out. I mean, Clearly. I was doing Rocker's Revenge. Yes, that's what I did. Just around the time mm-hmm. me and Tony were becoming friends and then during that that summer is when he went and did the ITF. So the whole thing started to gain momentum. But I think we were quite fortunate as an outfit to be out, you know, DJing from the beginning. So when I'd left the job, I could kind of make Mm. ends meet by playing out. And then during the day, just build routines and work on new, you know, new ideas. Where do you get your tenacity from, Joe? Like, where's, where does, is it, is is hip hop the bug for you? Because to a lot of people that are listening right now, they'll, they'll, we're skipping quite an emotive uh, perspective because you, 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 hip hop is so you that you're at least you're talking as if it's just a given. To a lot of people, it's like, what? You were just there. You just did that. You were what drove you? Well, it was. I mean, the, it's a demanding. You know, every aspect of that of cult of that culture of hip hop culture is a very demanding thing. You can't. There's no shortcut to any of it. You know, you've got to be incredibly dedicated. Um, to visit the record stores, to put yourself in danger at gigs, mm. to you know frequent the places you need to frequent, um, and put yourself in danger, yeah. <laughs> and and just study the you know the 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 thing. I mean, for me, it, it was it was DJing, but it's it's equally true for people who are into the you know the dance and the art side of things. The Battling, yeah. Scene, yeah, and it's that. I just love the fact that you're trading off of what you can do and it's n- there's nothing else it's not about yeah. you know it's not about your garms or your money or your flex it's about what you can do yeah. it's, you know and that that really excited me and still and still does i still you know even when we became a collective you know all the way through to you know me tony and neil spinning you know dub plates you know drum and bass and and and, mm. and stuff like you know producer like scream we were trying to outdo one another it was kind of a battle but we managed to figure out a way of it seeming like this united force. But we were yeah, yeah. really trying to outdo one another. And I think that kept everything, energy, maximum, you know, trying, everyone wants to have the best ideas, everyone wants to have the best yeah. 
tunes, the best dubs. And I think that that's it, it all stems from that real sort of b boy ethic. Makes it exciting, makes people want to be engaged. It doesn't, there's a performance aspect to it as well, which I think hip hop DJing also brings to the sphere as well, doesn't it? Yeah, and I, I, I'm, I'm quite excited by the idea of trying to apply that style to other forms of music as well. Mm. I was saying about playing at the dance all night. Mm. I used to play it in, a, in a, the way you'd play hip hop. So I'd hit Daddy Calls, get like, you know, eight versions of the same rhythm on jammies, but then bash through them as if it was like, you know, just play verse. Bash versus like bash. So it's almost like yeah. you're pulling a rewind, but you're just mm. and it, it, people go. But I wish I had footage of that club. Actually, yeah. it was a New Year's Eve, I think, in ninety one, ninety two, when people were climbing the walls. I remember thinking at the time because oh, there was a guy with a camera in the corner, thinking, "I'd love to see that." Yeah. I've always wondered what happened to that tape. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, the classic uh, hip hop and any club nights that I remember as a as a kid is just oh. And you guys were very much a part. Um, Tony being in the record stores, I remember ITF being the, the that was one of the uh, main anchor points for DJs of, in hip hop, especially every year. Of course, I mean, when the Pickles did the, the, the X Men execution just out uh, when they, that battle happened and it yeah, was part of the ITF, I think that just that event resonated through, through the whole world and beyond i mean i remember sharing a flat at the time with two brothers and my mate drew in brixton and uh they were re i mean they weren't really into hip-hop but they would watch that battle mm. again and again and again and again because it's just it's like the pinnacle of something you're seeing the absolute pinnacle of certain yeah. uh, of, of an art form it's it's incredibly infectious and you guys were there at the right time like you say Tony came back from... I mean, there are other areas that on, we, we can obviously cover mm. the relationship between you and Harry and you giving him his first, you know, pieces of equipment to, to mess with and stuff. Like, there's a lot of, uh, you know, fault lines here. But but um, from my introduction and understanding, it was almost like when Tony came... It was almost like when Tony came back from succeeding at ITF, there was always already this forward march of, well, actually, I've got a crew and actually this is about to happen and actually we're joining in with these guys over in America. Yeah, I mean the, the 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 timing of it. None of it was, you know, it wasn't some kind of it was it wasn't some no. kind of plan. But like when the crew, like really early on in the crew, when I was still sort of humming and hawing about whether you know whether to make the jump and whether what I was going to do, you know, if I was going to get involved in this thing, mm. you know, Paul and Mark were like this kind of double act, and they were going out and gigging mm. and spreading the, the you know the name around the country at the time. They were out there. <laughs> for you know a good six months to a year and then summer 97 tony wins the heat in new york and i think that really changed everything yeah suddenly the spotlight was like boom it's on these guys you know i got goosebumps i can see yeah. i can't even think about that time without getting goosebumps it's just like <laughs> oh that was just yeah. like because what happened was uh if it's all scratch pickles They'll come over and do something. I remember Fresh 97, I always go on about, bang on about Fresh 97. But that was, for me, like, they brought it to a place mm. that was so radically, like, different to anything that was going on. And I'll see you later, gone, and off they go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've left yeah. a massive hole, and people wanted more of it. And then I remember the following month, it must have been a month later, Concord 2, you, um, Tony, uh, prim um, plus, uh, no, it's the thing, and first rate. You four were at Concord Two, and I remember it. I yeah. remember it. It was actually at the. It wasn't Concord Two. It was the one that was just behind the pier. That's not there anymore. The, yeah, the little one. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the Concord. Yeah, that's it. Maybe the first. Yeah, the knowledge yourself nights. Yes. Yeah, that was the night. I think that was the first night I did Jack of Spades. That juggle. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And talking yeah, yeah. to Mech, you know, Mech, Mex. Mex, big um, up Mex. Yeah. Chatting to Mex about that afterwards, and I think I drank a bottle of vodka. I, I just Go remember well, so well, man. Like I was at the front, like me and my woolly hat and my baggy clothes, thinking <laughs> I was I was so hip hop. And uh, fuck, yeah, it was good times, man. I mean, it just, it just, there was, it, it was just happening, you know. It was really happening. Mm. And even though the pickles, they yes, they stepped away from battling, but they were, you know, still very active. And I still get a lot of pleasure from watching D Styles cut. Still, you know, rate that guy as the greatest scratcher to have, have walked the earth. Mm. Just a very, very, very enjoyable mm. experience. It's tinged with pain and mm. dread as well because you're watching, thinking, <laughs> "Fucking hell!" Do you still uh, get that now? 
Yeah, man, totally. I just, you know, if watching, you know, someone who's really, really good at cutting, it's, it, 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 it's I love it, but it's also that kind of, ah, oh, there's a t- there's an element of like, fuck, man, I need, to, I, need to, I need to learn that, I need to learn that, I've got to learn that. Mm. And I, I like that... Um, because I stepped away from scratching for a while. It wasn't really currency in clubs when we were, yeah, yeah. you know, bashing through dub plates and stuff around that time. So what time we talking? Even though we were doing scratching, maybe from like 04 to like yeah. 10. Yeah. That period of time, it was about what the record could do to an audience mm-hmm. rather than what you did with the record. Do you know what yeah. I mean? It was like, so the clubbing thing, yeah, we were knee deep in that dub plate thing. We would really, you know, that was, that was our... That, you know, that was the nine to five, and it, when when the the yeah you know, the the relevance of the scratching yeah you know, when it as it subsided it, it was quite a difficult thing to deal with really, because you guys were used like, to yeah this is my shit you know this yeah. is what I do so when can't I just be called the perverts like? <laughs> <laughs> I mean we do still do it but it wasn't like it wasn't like a, a thing that you would study and I kind of lost I forgot the joy that you get from seeing something that's a mystery mm. and unpicking it until it's no longer a mystery yeah, and you're yeah. doing it and you're nailing it and mm. you've worked that thing out. And that is, it's one of the, it's probably the best feeling in life actually to, to see a particular pattern and just be like, what? I don't understand that at all. And then get to a stage, hopefully only a few days later where you've, you've figured it out. Mm. But I'd forgotten that. And then around maybe 20, 2011, 2012. I actually messaged Dave Deestar. I was saying, I'm getting back into this thing. I just want you to know. I just want you to know. <laughs> he must have read it like, <laughs> you fucking care. But uh, it was just like this big thing. I'm going to do it. I'm going to get back into it. <laughs> but um, I've, I've, yeah, I've rediscovered a love for it and I, I just enjoy it. And I feel like it's become, it's become a, a relevant thing with the technology for sure. advancing to a stage where, you know, Paris Hilton can have a residency in Ibiza and the culture's been so diluted, this yeah. one aspect of it, you can't you can't mm. sink button scratching. You can't mm. do that. Mm. You know, it's a very human mm. thing. And I think that's why I love D Styles so much, is because when he's scratching, it's Dave scratching. It's not D Styles, it's him. You mm. feel you feel you can really feel an essence of him performing. Yes. hundred um, percent. Yeah. Do you um uh, yeah, the clinical side to that, loving the equipment, loving the scratching. I mean, uh, the engineering of when you were younger, being into the engineering, but also I know you as a drummer. I know yeah. you were a drummer back in the day as well. So the patterns yeah, yeah. that you do with your scratching, ultimately, as clinical as they are, I think for me personally as a beatboxer, listening to your scratching, I can. I, it's like patterns of drum roll kind of uh, sharpness. I think the... Yeah, I think the, the the drumming thing actually helped the scratching and vice versa, really, because I, I was into scratching before I got my first set of drums was in uh, 92. Mm. I went and bought a drum kit from uh, Supreme Drums in Walthamstow. Oh, if I could have a time machine and go back to that day, because they had some, they had like some Gretsch jazz kits, which are now hen's teeth. There was like half a dozen of them, you know, 500 quid. And now you just never, you never see never that kind of snow. And there was like a drum store in Dartford and I got quite friendly with the dude who ran it and we used to do, (laughs) I can't believe I'm saying this, we used to do um, uh, like credit card and checkbook fraud. Who did? (laughs) Back in the day. Fucking genius. And I managed to, I won't say the shop's name or the bloke (laughs) who uh, owned it, but I I managed to get this Gretsch kit that used to belong to... um, Paul Weller's drummer, Paul White. I think he he got a sponsorship from Pearl. Yeah. And um, th- it was in there. And I remember I, I, that same week I'd driven to this other spot in Birmingham because they, 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 I wanted this particular kit. I wanted this um, a downbeat kit, which is what Clyde Stubblefield used. So I took this VHS tape round to all these different drum shops saying, look, what, what drum kit's this? Found out it was a, a downbeat. Drove to, to Birmingham to buy it. And we just couldn't get it to sound good. It was, it was knackered. It all warped in the sunlight. So I had to drive all the way home with this cheap kit that I bought from uh, from this place in Wolverhampton. It was a Premier kit, and I managed to trade in my Premier kit and a little. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who are listening and not watching, yeah, the sound exp- self-explanatory. <laughs> it was a very, very, very long time ago. Yeah. So hopefully that doesn't mean. You yeah, know, it's past tense, all right. Proceedings. Yeah, yeah. High and tight. Tenure in jail. Yeah. yeah. No, you're all right. You're all right. I love water under the bridge, uh, dude. When. 
when I think of your scratching, and there'd be a lot, a lot of other people that mirror the affection that you have for these styles, but actually in you as well. Like people, when they see you scratch, that shit is intimidating. <laughs> I've seen fuckers <laughs> turn around and just be like watching, not wanting to watch. <laughs> They're just there like, the fuck? Uh. You know that too. Like what you added within UK DJing is so immeasurable especially when you have a vehicle that comes to fruition at the perfect time, which was Scratch Perverts. All of a sudden, it, like you're saying, it's not a case that, oh, we'll get any Tom, Dick and Harry into the crew. Mm. No, you guys had to have been the right age, the right sensibility, the right technical ability. You know, there was so much stuff that was going on and it, it was more than just right place, right time. It was just yeah. a lot of other things, wasn't it? Yeah, and everyone, I mean, everyone, everyone had their kind of own style you know mm. everyone brought something quite unique i think to the table and, mm. and you know the reason for joining a crew is so that you everyone can kind of absorb a bit mm. from everyone else so everyone was kind of everything was being thrown into this kind of melting pot and all these different techniques were coming around because there were you know the technology was affording you to do this stuff so when the like the 07 when that came out it allowed you to do all these different techniques and i used to build these um hamster switches yeah no. so before <laughs> It's the engineering <laughs> bit again. <laughs> yeah, before, yeah, in lunch breaks, I'd be like taking a few boxes down to deal real and people, you know, flog them. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, I think but it was, DJLX got one as well, big up DJLX. Yeah, it, it allowed you, say, like a, on a, like a, a Technics mixer or you know, something, it allowed you to sort of swap the, the input so you could have it sort of hamster style and then swap it back for juggling sort of traditional. Mad. Yeah, yeah, it was... Um, that that ninety eight routine in DMC, that that winning routine that heavily uses that hamster switch because you can see I'm going from normal to reverse, and it allowed that trick of using the cross fader and the up fader with the thumb, the kind of two faders at once trick. Um, yeah, so yeah, just so for you, so you're listening or not watching, so you've got your the, the two back fingers, the two back fingers and a thumb finger. The back finger's hitting the cross fader. Yeah, cutting that, the fader's being cut in and out with these two with fingers the two and fingers. the thumb's bringing the beat in and, and out. Yeah, and so the thumb's So you can kind of go diddle 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 and boom, cat, boom, cat. And yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, right, I got you, so the thumb is doing the up fader. Basically. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so and you can only do that if it's the wrong way around. You can't do it the other way. And the Euro scratch, you can only do that with a I was just going to come to the Euro. So reverse, this was around yeah, the same yeah. time as Euro scratch. And again, this is Rob Euro well, coming up with the Euro scratch. Yes, this was, well, Rob, I think Rob, what we, that's 99, Rob came up with it. He rung me up, you're like, oh, come up with a new scratch pattern. Yeah. <laughs> really? A whole new one. He's like, no, seriously. Ser so I got in the car, <laughs> drove to Brighton, and he's showing me. I'm, I'm not joking. When he was shouting, I literally <laughs> pushed him off the decks. <laughs> get off. <laughs> let me get, let me try that. And uh, it's just one of those really, like, very, very lucky things of the, the timing of it. Again, it was like it's just before battle season. Mm. And for some reason, you know, the, it was a natural movement for me to do. And... Yeah, bless, bless Rob. Give me my name and, uh, and, yeah. a, and a nice mechanism to, yeah. to, to battle A track later in the year. So in the, the Hawaii battle, battle kind of lent heavily. The outro of that battle was Euro, was, was Euro scratch, scratching. Bro, you got that, like, yeah. big up, big up, Rob Euro. Yeah, yeah, man. Jeez, come up with a scratch. What the fuck? Um, t technical abilities, uh, the, the, the trade-off of Euro scratching and whatnot, you know, all at the right time. Um, meanwhile, in the background, there's Harry Love, and you know, in in equal generosity, you're you're kind of you're you're kind of nurturing him with new pieces of equipment and trying and testing things out. Am I right in thinking that? Was that kind of the order of the day? Yeah, I mean, Harry was, um, yeah, he was there from like really early on. He, he joined maybe later than than me but it was all within such a short time frame if you're looking back it's joining like, this the scratch is, yeah this is all yeah. within you know this is like a kind of six months thing and i think harry from from a very early stage was was really in tuned into making beats and i think that's the path he you know mm. he was naturally going to follow so the the crew didn't you know the crew was all about battling that was mm. it we were about um you know that was the 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 whole reason for us forming so i think by the end of sort of 99 th thing you know people were kind of moving in slightly different directions whereas for me me personally i still saw it as this kind of pure battling entity that mm. did happen to go out and you know gig at the weekends and mm. earn a living from it but the vision was to just keep keep that going and you know we wanted to win 
the team thing for a second time in, in 2000 and worked very, very hard on that routine. Um, and would have. It would have been nice if we'd have won that. It would have, we, we, that means we would have been sitting on three, three um, victories rather than two. Mm. But we uh, fucked it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that year, Crazy No Track won it. But the you know, year before New York, year after we formed the Perverted Allies with uh, Crazy and Infamous. That's right. Um, yeah, the, and the, that all happened the week of 9-11 as well. That was a crazy, crazy wow. time. Wow. Oh, that feels a long time ago, don't Yeah, we were rehearsing at Tony's when that happened. So you seeing that all unravel with two guys from America and uh, Greg from Shaw Needles who knew lots of people mm. who worked in the sort of financial district of New York. It was a... A, a very, very strange experience. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, yeah. Life things, isn't it? Mm. Um, you mentioned that within a... Did you say six months? That all this kind of... So, with Harry... Well, you, you're saying... Oh, the, the, I mean, the, the timeline of it is like kind of... The, 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 the formation was sort of... People were aware of one another for years. I mean, I knew Paul for from, like, 88. Mm. Um, you know, I, was, I went and visited the the borderline when he um, battled the enforcers and you know that was that was 1994 so we, we were all aware of one another for some years before you know the crew sort of formed 96 97 mm. and then I, re, I I downed tools at work at the end of 97 right so for me personally 98 was the year that everything changed mm. because it allowed me to you know I, I, I turned my nine to five into being into DJ and that was what I was doing so when I was at home, that was all I did for that year was prepare for the DMCs. Crazy, isn't it? And the, the, we had the team ITFs against the junkies and, yeah, you can't, I've, kept, I've, kept, I've got the gig diaries going back to this time. Mm. So you go through it and you sort of see there's this happening, then this happening, then two weeks later this is happening. It's like, man, how do we, how do yeah. we, how do we get all this done? You know, the week, you know, me and Paul played the opening weekend or the second opening weekend of Fabric. And then at the same time... Opening you know, weekend of Fabric. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I, I, they, they, I did an interview for one of their anniversaries maybe a year ago. Mm. And um, I was saying to Michelle, my, my, my missus, I was like, I'm going to go through the, the gig diaries and find out how many times I've played the club because I reckon it's going to be like quite a lot of going through. Because mm. like, I've got the... You know, Every month for fifteen years. So yeah, at that time it was I was I played one hundred and fifty eight times, one hundred and fifty eight, and I've now played one hundred and fifty nine, one hundred and fifty nine wow. times. Yeah, and the a lot of people can say that <laughs> they can't. They don't look after their schedules. They, you know, the 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 the, the last one was funny because the, the, all the securities changed, and I'd been there for you know six months or whatever, and it was a different team on the door, and um. I, I just turned up in my bag and my mixer and stuff, and uh, the, the the lady that was do, doing the security was sort of doing a pat down thing, and I didn't have ID. She's like, "You haven't been here before, have you?" Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "It's funny you should say that. This is actually the hundred and fifty eighth time I've played her, and she and just laughed at me. Stage, she just yeah. laughed at me. <laughs> That's hilarious. That's hilarious. Fa fa fabric's got to that point now where that is a thing, isn't it? Like the turnaround of people over the decades has been so to that extent that." But, you know, you can't possibly have them all playing still. It's impossible, isn't it? No, we were, I mean, we worked there regularly for 15 years, mm. yeah, on a on a monthly basis. I mean, that's... Unheard of, isn't that it? That is, I would, yeah, personally see that as as, as a equal, if not bigger, achievement than, than winning some of the competitions. To do that, to remain in that environment. Um, and yeah. be able to sit here and tell the story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like, because... Um, Obviously, the dynamics. You you mentioned the first time that you played Fabric was with, with first rate Paul. Yeah. Dynamically, the four of you, 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 and this was the interesting thing as a punter before anything was the idea that you guys could break away and have these different, almost like fractions, and then go and do multiple shows across a weekend. That really stirred up the name and built. The oh, a hundred percent. Yeah, every weekend there was you know there was six dudes going out and gigging. Um, very rarely, in fact, almost never, the, f the four of us, other than in, in a competition or you say when we did the thing for Knowledge, knowledge Yourself. Mm. But it was mainly sort of two-man outfits going out. So you'd have... It, over time, it naturally became Paul and Mark, me and Tony, and uh, Kev Renegade and Harry Love. Those are the those are the kind mm. of the duos going out and doing it. And, mm. But if you look through the gig list, there's lots of 
PC plus one PC, our EP. I mean, we, 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 it all sort of, there was no rhyme or reason to it. It's just whoever the promoter wanted to book, that was who was going to come do the gig. It wasn't like it was a, a choreographed thing. But it was, we were in that fortunate position to be able to go out and, and earn a living from that while preparing mm -hmm. for a DMC or an ITF. And that's what's crazy. Because when you think about it as, I think it's maybe it's just the romantic b-boy in me, but the whole idea of like, you have your, you have the, the training ground at DMC. You no, know, you have the training cl ground at club nights, really. <laughs> but then when it comes to DMC, you, you're, uh, that's the gladiator arena. And, you know, all the, the team comes together like Voltron, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, yeah, no, we're going to get, we're going to do this. We're really doing it because we ain't just about doing the circuit thing, you know, we're just building our brand. But when we come together, that's where you show and prove. I love that idea. Yeah, and we used to practice, we practiced in my flat in West Norwood. And um, so the, the, the four of us would be in this little room that there was no kind of like neighbouring person there was like a stairwell to the left and then my living room to the right right and the lady downstairs this old lady bless her she was deaf so she couldn't hear and we didn't disturb anyone we would make a racket for like eight <laughs> hours non-stop trying to figure out how are we going to you know how are we going to make this Clyde Stubblefield pattern and it, it would be hellish yeah, yeah, to live yeah. next door to that <laughs> so we were we were very fortunate to have a spot to rehearse and then I think uh when we got closer to the battle we actually were, were hired a rehearsal space in Croydon. Um, so we'd get that kind of sense of being at a gig oh, yeah. rather than being in someone's living room and you'd, you'd, you would have wedges set up, speakers, so it would feel like we were on stage. So we prepared for, you know, mm. the sort of stage experience in New York. Um, yeah, and got Cell One to do the, uh, and uh, as the allies come in, to land he was the one who did the voiceover for that and I went and had to cut, I cut the dub plate down at transitions so we've got, really? I've, got I've still got it at home so we did that kind of like with the mm, noise of the plane remember. coming in and shut, shut the plane down dissed every member of, um, of the allies and it worked you know it worked in New York we kind of did a New York centric routine and after the, uh, the experience in London at the at Subterranean that was a, that was a that was a good feeling yeah We'll get to subterranean in a bit, but just behind me right here is is the new mic mixer that uh, you gave me in New York. You oh, gave that to me. Really? Yeah. Oh wow. Where's the rest of it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think my skills would be to all the rest of it a new arsehole, but no, it's just uh, no, you gave me that um because there's obviously four of you and then this fifth one was around and you were like, Well, you're in the crew, you you have it. Wow. And I was like, yeah, wow. I didn't do shit and I got one. <laughs> Yeah, but well, you know. No, but you wooed New York, man. You were like, you were the toast of the town, man. Mm. You guys went and killed the Roxy, right? Yeah. Killed it. <laughs> killed killed it. Five as well. You know the one, um, it was you, um, you, First Rate, and Vadim, actually, that were all adamant and like, you pay your fucking flight over there, we'll do the rest. Like, Pr Tony Prince will love you and we'll just do it. So I put all the money down on the flight. I ended up staying in a hotel room with, with first rate, you know, across the road from McDonald's. We were there most <laughs> most morning, evenings, and afternoons. But um, I got the money paid back by Tony Prince. Oh, because really? Because I did the two shows. Of course, yeah, but you perform, right? Yeah. 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 So who, who dares? Oh, well, that's good. That's and thanks good. to you guys, you know what that's I mean? That's good. I remember that, um, that, day, that, that, that day leading up to the evening of, of DMC, you guys had... I mean, listen, this, this, what they do is legit. Back then, you had the decks all in the hotel room. <laughs> so shit. Man. Like, you know, it was just a fucking, it was a, a DJ's heaven. And then, um, come the evening, I remember th there was a lot of delays in the uh, line, line, as usual. Which you would get yeah, in. you know what? I don't remember any of that. I don't remember, I don't, I remember having to cart six turntables in flight cases back when you could actually do that. I mean, you couldn't do that now. You'd, mm. you'd, it would cost you thousands, so we've we've all taken a pair of turntables each, or you know, enough for six, and we're rehearsing. And I remember that they didn't announce the winner until the following day, and and having that sense of like whoever yeah. are they going to announce, and in second place because that yeah. was when you knew. And when they said the allies, all of us were like, oh shit, we yeah. got it, we got it. I remember it so well. And then when we flew, <laughs> when we flew home. I don't know if someone in the uh, the baggage area of New York Airport caught wind of the fact that we won in America. <laughs> we were travelling home, but the decks got destroyed 
on the way home, all six in-flight cases got completely smashed what? to bits. It was like being on the conveyor when they came out. It was just, but no one gave a fuck because it's like we've won. We're, we're the world champions. It doesn't matter. It doesn't yeah, yeah. matter. Yeah. So we. Uh, yeah. I don't remember that. Did that happen? Yeah, that happened. That happened. Wow. I don't yeah, maybe it wasn't all six. It was just mine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Getting home and it's like there was dents in the flight case and the turntable was just mash up. But I do remember, and I think I brought this up with Mr. Thing on the podcast, the uh, John Peel was pretty much four days after we landed or something, wasn't it? We, <sighs> we went and did his 60th birthday. Yeah, do you remember that? Yeah, bless him. Man, yeah. that was, yeah, what an experience. That was crazy. He was hammered as well, do you remember? He was yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I was just so like done in by the amount of people that were there. I think I just stuck behind you guys the whole <laughs> fucking time. I was like, I was like, you know what I mean? Because I'm at that time. I think I was about eighteen, nineteen, and I didn't really have a great care for music in the same way as I did once I was in it. Right, so right. All I knew was, as a scraggly head hip hop head, you guys were gods to me, and all this lot. I didn't know it was Joe Wiley or I didn't. None of that mattered to me because I was just so immersed in hip hop. You guys were it. You'd fucking want the DMCs. We're playing. For, of course, we're doing John Peel. You know, <laughs> it was just a given. You know. Yeah, that was just. I don't remember the glitz and the glamour. I remember that we didn't prepare, so we just kind of like just we ended up having to kind of really wing it, and John announcing us as being shit hot. Yeah, that was just like yeah. Man, I'm not going to forget this one very because I I grew up on his show. It's like. I used to listen to his show as I fell asleep. I was a huge fan of him mm. and having, you know, parents that were, that were into music and would take me to gigs and stuff. And he was, he was, he was a respected person for years and years prior to that happening. Mm. It was a real big deal for me. I felt like he was like part of my, uh, you know, youth experience, really. Mm. He kind of held my hand a bit with music and would play with such a kind of... Honesty, you know, you know, there was no mm. bullshit about him at all. It was just like I'm going to play you this, and it's going to blow your mind. You know? It's uh, a, a, an irreplaceable force, I think, in, the, in, in in music. And to think that you played his 60th, but that must have been a coming of homes. You know, you must have been like, <gasps> yeah, it's all a bit of a blur now. But at the time, it was just like you say, it was just, you're, you're talking, you know, 98, 99. It was this, then this, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened. It's like, you know, it was a. a, a there was so much going on. I'm very pleased I get, I get those gig diaries because you wouldn't believe, you know, to look I'm at it. I'm surprised you like, did. I'm surprised yeah. you... So, you, so in a real kind of Bob Monkhouse kind of way, you've kind of collected all... <laughs> <laughs> Do you know I mean? You've got... You've amassed all the, like, l- <laughs> legacy that you did at that time. Yeah, it's... You know, I'll, I'll show the kids at some point. And if they don't believe me, it's like, I've actually... Yeah, this is living proof that this the dad did so this. It really was dad this. this. Dad See? actually did this. And this you really were. Uh, uh, <laughs> right, so you and... You and Tony, as of that point, these, this, this... You're like two-headed monsters, you guys. Like, the moment, like, you... you d- 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 Rock star doesn't even come into it, man. Like you guys were, you 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 trailblazed DJing, and all of a sudden you guys were fucking way cooler than fucking Liam and Noel. All of a sudden you were just like, all of a sudden it was just like, yo, you guys are on the tabloids. You guys are, you guys are like superstars, and you walk out. It's not that you know, John Peel, big up, but you ain't, you ain't Tony and Joel. From a rock and roll standpoint, you guys were going in. Like it was almost like no holes barred. You were going in. Yeah, I think we yeah, we we enjoyed ourselves maybe <laughs> maybe a bit too much. I think I, I, me and Tony are quite quite similar characters, and I think I, I, I mean I can't. It was one of my best friends. Now I speak to him like almost every day. Big up Tony, um, of course. And um, yeah, that kind of realization early on that. That this, you know, this is someone I kind of have an awful lot of um, love for as a friend, and I think that that friendship sort of um, tied us together quite quite early on in the crew's mm. sort of formation, and ideas as well when we were sharing ideas and trying to think of different ways of you know manipulating a mixer or you mm. know when we were getting ready for ScratchCon and having a conversation with Dad initially about feedback and how we're playing. The Fillmore 
um, after party, and my dad's saying, that's you, know, that's, you know, that's a that's a real famous Hendrix venue. Then yeah. we were talking about Hendrix and him manipulating the guitar and feedback, and it just sort of that's set crazy. this thought process off in my mind of like, I wonder if a, I wonder if you could do that. And I, when Tone came around, we were practicing for I can't remember what we were probably getting ready for ScratchCon, and I remember talking to him and saying to him as I was doing it. Perhaps if you feed the mixer and you put it in the back and that, and both of us were like, oh shit. And that was that was the take, take, take it off at ScratchCon. That was that was how it happened. It was a there and then thing. It just it was like immediately awesome. That's some rock and roll <laughs> shit. That uh just pushing them buttons up to feed feedback. Like you would... Yeah, it was just take the headphone out and put the headphone in, but because of the, the nature of the, the of the Vestax mixer allowed you to change the kind of pitch of the of the feedback depending on how much you feed into it itself. So you could get these kind of different tones and that's why we ended up with that kind of siren noise at the end of the routine. Um and it got yeah, there's it's a standard ovation, man. I'll never forget it. I couldn't yeah, we were in this really quite intimidating mm. Yeah. Situation of real kind of hardcore scratch fans and did this thing of taking all the records off. You had to take, do something, yeah. Showing, take you know, it off, take it off. Yeah, I remember yeah. this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. If you watch, if you watch, <laughs> if you watch the D Styles and Cubert showcase, which is incredible, mm. incredible. It's still mind blowing. But you will see Cubert the very beginning. Cubert is shaking his head like that. And it's because we've just finished and we just finished doing that feedback routine. And he was like, nah. Big up Q. <laughs> yeah, that was a mad, that was a mad, Everything mad visit. That, listen, from a UK point of view, and obviously, you know, there's there's levels of feedback of, uh, of, of, of and resonance of, like, things that you're doing within an island, people getting super excited about it. And being the capital, or at least the entry hole to Europe as being the, the, the PR capital, your world was an oyster at that stage. You throw things like, technical ability into the mix untouchable it's like eddie van halen it's like you, you can't you can't you can't bottle that well it was just it was just a it's a timing thing it's like that you know that came at the just the right time i mean you could argue that we should have not done it at scratch con we should have waited until the dmcs so there was a bit of a conversation as to whether we should actually showcase it because we kind of showed our mm. hand to to craze and infamous mm. like and that's you know but I'm glad we did it. I'm, mm. I'm, glad, I'm really glad we did it there. And it was so it was so amazing to be to be flown over there by the Bickles to yeah. to be involved in the Mad. whole thing. It was incredible, incredible, bonkers stuff, rock star business. Um, how well did it get? Because I hear stories. Obviously, we've had a couple of podcasts now. Uh, things like uh, DJ Prime cuts in an airport and just buying a Rolex and <laughs> oh man oh god oh, man. like how, how, how the, yeah. you know if you were to really epitomize to what to the degree of rock star it became tell me the most wildest story that oh, even now you I'll... say to yourself shit did i really do that yeah obviously the, wa- nothing the watch thing the watch thing was obviously it was a real you know i got really into time pieces at, uh, uh, and yeah combined <laughs> Like some international travel and a like a few drinks in the in the bar and then sort of hatching the idea. Oh, well, I'll go and have a look at some watches and then the next thing you've sort of spent five grand on a timepiece that you then have to take on tour. <laughs> the, whole, the whole tour. <laughs> the whole tour with you. There's lot I mean, yeah, the things were I mean, we would you know, when when it all kicked off we were still yeah, we were young men. It was like mm. 27, 27? Yeah, yeah, 20, 25, 26, yeah. 27. That, that, I mean, obviously Harry was, was markedly younger than us, mm. um, but everyone in the team was roughly the same age. I think Mark was a year younger maybe, or the same, exactly the same age as me. Tony's almost exactly the same age as me. He often reminds me of the fact I'm three months or four months <laughs> older than him. But it was, yeah, we, yeah, we got stuck in, man. We really, really enjoyed every aspect of it. Um, and managed somehow to dance that kind of merry dance of debauchery and and focus. You know, you have to focus, you know, getting ready for the ITF in 2000. That was like a three-month intense time for me, just 12-hour shift in it, trying to figure out a way of maintaining that title after winning it in 99. Did it ever get a lot? Did it, like, cause, did it, because, like you say, the dance... 
Um, I think anyone that's anyone that's ex exceeded has to pass their own expectations, or at least hit hit a peak of you know success. They've all experienced that that dance. But but when you've got when you've got a couple of, of opportunities like I've got to go on stage, and the variables are nuts. The record could skip. I could just be I could just be hung over. But you know what I mean. That's a real hard dance when you've been practicing so long, but then you know doing a lot of extracurricular stuff at the same time. It's a lot, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, we one of the early gigs we did was supporting the Beastie Boys at Brixton Academy, and Tony was destroyed. It was so bad. Sorry, Tony. <laughs> Told but you. The, the, <laughs> but when we're we're we're, we're all side of stage, right? Who's going to go on first? Tony's like, I'm going first, and I'm just thinking, fuck. You know, how's he gonna? And he nails it. He absolutely nails it. Even though he's hungover. And even he was, he was in such a state. I mean, we were all feeling quite worse for wear. We were on right at the very end of the night as well. It wasn't like we we didn't play before. We played afterwards. But the executioners were there. The pickles were there. It was a it was a mad. And I remember Sinister Joe Sinister coming up to me after I'd done my routine and said, "You you must go in for DMC this year." And that really lit fire in the belly because mm. it was like, "Okay, I'm getting a little nod here from." From someone who I've, you know, been studying his beat juggling for years. I mean, Badass. The, the, that, that theme from Swat Juggle is still one of my favourite things ever to come out of this thing. What did you think when Tony came on a podcast here? Uh, I, think, I thought it was good. I thought it was good, yeah. honest, long <laughs> <laughs> interview. <laughs> Like I said, it's a double. You know, yeah. the, you guys were like some double headed dragon, and it was. It, and and I, I, when he first came on, I thought, well, it's going to put the cat in miles pigeons, isn't it? <laughs> well, I, you know what, I love Tony. I think he was just too, just, just very sort of humble. Fuck that, you know. Yeah. The, the, the the kid would that whole thing that he did in that time. It's it's, it's very easy to see some of these techniques, and it's a given. Mm. You know, it's very easy to see that there, there's like a kind of, you know, you see someone execute something where they're actually concentrating on the up faders, or that was something that he brought thousand percent to the, to the table in '97, and yeah. it can't be overstated how revolutionary that shit was. Mm. It was like some completely different approach to this mm. thing, especially being an English guy just going into the American. Yeah, turning up in a fisherman's hat and a Ben Sherman and sandals, you know. Yeah. Everyone was like, who's, who's this dude? Mm. He's, a, he's cosmic. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's just going to take every motherfucker <laughs> out. Like, it was, yeah. Um, he doesn't get his, um, uh, yeah, like you say, I think he's, there's a humbleness to it, which is obviously endearing. But, but then you lose, you know, these important conversations, don't you? Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I, I'm, I've never been one to sort of, sit there and think I haven't got my props for X, Y and Z because it's, you know, it's all there. It's all historically there. Everyone knows, you know, you can see it in the videos and the competitions and the titles, you know, four, four world titles. I'm really, you know, proud of that mm. legacy. Four world titles, you um, know. Yeah, two, two, two scratching and two, two teams. Yeah. You know, and facing something, you know, facing A-Track, man, it's no joke. Madness. No, no joke. But it's, um, and the following year in, in LA, it was, uh, that was a, uh, an amazing experience. Me and Neil went and did that together. So we had Neil plus we, one. Yeah, plus one. We we shared a, a hotel room with. Um, <laughs> I, this isn't a sexist thing. This was actually like a, a military exclusive, kind of exclusive. thing. Exclusive. But we, I would have kind of er, erotic images around the the practice area. Of course. To keep the testosterone yeah, levels yeah. high. So everyone was just like, Ugh. Yeah, man, absolutely. <laughs> Listen, that's no joke. I do that. I did that. You used to do that in the studio all the time. But it was, yeah, we, uh, <laughs> we, we were in the same hotel as Shaggy as well. So we met, we met, we met Shaggy yeah. at the hotel. It was quite it's a mad fantastic. one as well. Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> but wicked memories, man. And it's like, it's just, it's funny looking back and still, I can still sense that kind of, just an, a, a a degree of confidence that I had in myself that I, yeah, I felt like I owned the venue that night. It's yeah. like that, this: I'm having this. This is I'm, I'm taking this time. I'm really home. doing I'm this. I'm taking this home for a second time. Um, put myself through the mill really to prepare for it. 
but you can't, you know, it's that thing of looking back and just thinking, wow, man, did we really do that? Did we really manage to do that? Yes. Bonkers. Um, you mentioned Neil plus one. Of mm. course, each one of the scratch perverts uh, of the of the early noughties um, formation just all held such identifiable, charismatic, personal um, skills and performance. You know, vis visually and you know technically. Yeah, Neil was Neil was Neil was was and still is. Uh, a, a very, very, a great mind when it comes to arrangement and, and presentation. He had, I mean, his routines were like piece, uh, pieces of music thought mm. out and presented as such, so everything mm. would lead to the next bit. Very, very good, very, very good at that. And um, Mr Thing, of course, with the funk, the, the real loose, Jazzy Jeff, um, that kind of trusted... Funk, yeah, and, and and an incredible beat collector and enthusiast of all music, you know, mm. and, and, and he was that dude from the from the get go. He was a, an obsessive digger from the very very beginning, mm. um, and it's wonderful to see he's, he's doing great for himself now. Mm, I still sure. need to visit. I still need to visit your record shop. I still mm. need to make that trip to the yeah. coast. Yeah, I'm uh, first rate with the. Oh, just even saying his name, I can just picture him now on the decks and just the no fucks given. I mean, yeah. you know, these don't have to be decks. He's coming at you with whatever. <laughs> He's just <laughs> on you, man. He's like, it's like... Uh, very fond memories of like that, that night of the borderline. As sort of, again, it's sort of tinged with a, a feeling of like, I want to be on stage and being part of this, but I'd stepped away from, from, from DJing for a bit in 94 and then got sort of drawn back into it via, you know, gutter snipes mm. and, and, and so on. But watching watching that battle was something as it felt like the torch had been passed, um, maybe maybe slightly reluctantly, but it felt like something had shifted. This was the enforcers. Yeah, so battle, there was yeah. yeah, and there was other. I think uh, there were, there were other Madder. He was he mm. was in that com competition as well. First three was just a he's still without question. He's he was a real force to be reckoned. Yeah, with. I felt force. like he, yeah. although you know it was Tony's crew and. You know, the debates, I knew where the name came from. I certainly felt like Scratch Perverts. I, I, thought, that, I thought Theo came up with the name. I Perhaps it, it did, I thought, yeah. I thought it was Theo, Fake Blood. I fake thought... Blood did it. Yeah. Big there up was... Fake Blood, big up Theo. Yeah, big up Theo. Yeah, I think I'm... Because like, like I say, it, it was it was a collective of people based yeah. around Bongo yeah. first and then it became more and more serious and then... For you know, like I said, the tail end of '97, kicking, kicking the job and stuff. And your, yeah, the enforcers that became a quite a notorious kind of back and forth, didn't it? From what I remember, being a punter in the crowd. Well, they were, they were the dudes before us. It was like they were they were you know they were winning competitions and 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 rocking clubs and stuff in the years you know, prior to us you know existing. Mm. So and rightly so, big up Pogo. Yeah, yeah, big up, all Billy of them, all of them, Johnny. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, was, um, it was quite mad actually to to, to end up in a, in a in a competition against them, at, yeah. um, Subterranea, where we, <laughs> we we thought we were like we were we were the the you know, the, the, the people's favourite, and uh, we realised very quickly we weren't. What that happened? Night. Oh, it just unravelled a little bit for us. It was like uh, it wasn't the most sort of friendly audience <laughs> for us. We ended up coming coming second, I think, but we still managed to qualify. Um, but it was that was a mad night. That was a real crazy, crazy mad night. I've tried to forget about it actually ever since. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? How that kind of pe people's choice thing. It quickly averts to someone. It, it, the I guess everyone has their time in the sun, and more so than most. Genres and cultures, hip hop and music, tend to have these this thing where it's like, no, you're not flavor of the month this this week. No, no, no. No matter what you do, we're not listening to you, we're not hearing you. No, we're not friends with you this week. And then all of a sudden you do something, something different, and all of a sudden it's like, yeah, you're back back on back on schedule. Yeah, it's quite it's it's quite a British trait that mm. that kind of building up and then breaking back down. I don't, I don't know if I would say that happens so much in in hip hop culture or you know in general. I think it's you. You're judged on your performance and what you do, and I think that was something that we, we when we the, the crew began to work as a as a an, an entity and a, and a group of 
people coming together and sort of sharing ideas, the whole thing kind of accelerated. Were you ever together in those situations where you did feel like the chips were down? Because, you know, band situations like bass, guitar, drums, like they, they often, that makes you stronger, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, the the first team competition we went into, we were facing the Junkies. I've got to say, that's probably my favourite battle memory. The Junkies, Rhett Mahal, is, my brother. It's, you know, that, that thing of, you know, you're facing these people who you've been studying for the last sort of few years and... When we'd done our routine and I think we, you know, we pulled it off quite well, I could sense that they were like, right, we're going to really have to go for this and stand inside the stage and like Melody's giving me the finger and it's like, yeah, man, this is, this is what it's all about, man. We're, 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 this, this is actually a fight. You know, we're, we're, we lost ultimately, but it was just a sense of like we're on the same stage as these dudes, mm. you know, J-Rock, Ramek, Babu. Melody, it's like these guys were kings, man. And it was, uh, yeah, the, the, their routine has really aged, but actually, as I checked it out the other day, it still sounds superb. Oh, man. Yeah, Amsterdam 98, that was. Apparently, that was the only time they actually did come out of the US. I don't think they took a venture any other time right. since. That was only at Amsterdam they went to, and I think they were all stoned at the time. So, really right. tells me <laughs> <laughs> they didn't really remember much of the, <laughs> the whole trip. <laughs> trip. Oh man, it, I mean, they, it's such an incredible concern they've got going, man. The junkies and that whole school thing happening has mm. been it's just been a, a, a fantastic thing to see. Such a positive thing happen mm. um, around the, the you know this this kind of DJ culture mm. and seeing those guys continue to smash it is fantastic, man. Mm. But you guys had that too, and and, and again, every single battle, lose or win, mm. it, it that it just felt like there was a machine. Um, a trusted uh, a belief between all of you that you were, that doesn't matter, keep going. Oh, 100%, 100%. Um, and, uh, the, the, you know, cer certain things you'd, you'd, to get the nod in Hawaii, was a, that was a super, super big deal. I was convinced that A-Trap was going to win that mm -hmm. one. Because of the judging panel, you just, you just naturally feel like a, be, you're a bit of an outsider. Mm. Um, you know, Mike, shortcut. Executioners on the judging panel. It's like I know Atrax Canadian, but he was like the golden boy at the time. And you just think, there's no way I'm going to get the nod on this. But to win that was that was just an incredible feeling. Mm -hmm. And then coming home and just all this other stuff happening in tandem. You know, the opening week. We're talking about a few weeks yeah. apart from the opening weekend of Fabric to the Hawaii battle. It's like they one was in October, one was in November. And then some some other kind of biblical thing happened yeah. in in December, January. It's just yeah, mad. Oh, it's funny you can, again to bottle it. It's just, that's just. I'm sure this happens more often than not because there is a refined way of doing things now, especially with the whole extra arm of social media. Mm. I'm pretty sure you know many fires are set, and then you can control and manipulate them. You know, like good managers do. But uh, at that time. You guys weren't even managed, were you, at that time? No, no. I mean, I don't think we were manageable, to be honest. I don't think it would have been a possible thing. I think that was one of the, you know, for me personally, was one of the reasons for, for changing the format of the crew was just to get an element of control mm. over the whole thing. And that's, you know, it's definitely a very selfish thing to have done. So, okay, um, hold on. But it was... One second, let me just, uh, let me just interject there just for one second. So, because I remember coming... I was there, I think I was in the crew for no more than like eight months tops mm. from what I remember. Um, and I remember that, that conversation arising where there was going to be a, a reformation, something was going to change. There was going to be a uh, a breakdown of, I mean, for me, it was like, well, that's cool because I'm in rock steady now. And not to mention, I've, you know, I, I wasn't in for that long. Mm. Um, was was that part of the theory behind it? You wanted it to, you, you, your idea was to kind of make it more manageable yeah, I think it was from a from a personal point of view. It was just to uh, to have a degree of control over the situation, um, and it was yeah, definitely, especially in the case of Paul and Mark, was a, was an unfair decision and and pretty brutal. Um, but you know, the twenty seven year old me at that time saw the direction of the crews. We you know we're, we're, this is a battle crew. We want to continue battling. We want to continue winning competitions, and that was that was the that was where my head was at at the time mm. and it felt like we needed to you know shrink this thing down 
to just two people. Mm. And that, and that was that happened at the very end of, of that year, yeah, ninety nine, going into the two thousands. Mm. Um, and then fast forward to maybe summer time, I think, of two thousand and one, we you know we um, asked Neil if he wanted to rejoin the crew, and then it was that format for you know the whole of the sort of two thousands. Mm. Um, and then Neil Neil was started doing the stuff with Jack Beats, and then I think. He and Benny probably didn't see the success coming that they were going to have. That whole mm. thing just blew, blew up. Yeah, it's true that blew as well. Because um, from a punter, as a punter, and I think Neil, I uh, speak to Neil about it quite a lot. Mm. I get what you're saying because Mr. Thing was very much on the beat thing. He was doing production. He was also going out on road with Vadim a lot as well. There was a lot of things going on that were taking away, perhaps taking away, like you say, the battle to be the best in the arena. Um, and first rate was also doing the Monkey Mafia stuff. He was doing the Us Three and a whole bunch of other Sure. Things. Everyone everyone was double busy. Everyone was double busy. It wasn't, it yeah. didn't, you know, it wasn't like everyone was just sort of thrown on the scrap heap and nothing was going to happen for everyone, anyone from that moment. Yeah. I think everyone was already very established in their own right as well as being part of the team. I don't think people, were, I don't think anyone could have foreseen the explosion that because what was like oh yeah we're crew we're gonna do the battle thing suddenly became you, you were all like four nights every weekend DJing. yeah 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 the club thing was it was I mean, it was absolute godsend because it was a like I say it was a way of keeping keeping financially stable while going in for the, the competitions not having to hold down like a yeah. day job because it, it affords you a lot more time to, to practice at home. Renegade was also on some whole other, you know, he's always been a staple of the, you know, worldwide hip hop scene and was obviously the Sun and Noise stuff and um, Harry with the beat productions. Mm. Like you say, I think lent a lot more towards the, maybe not entirely by choice, but he was always so naturally gifted at being a producer and a, but can you imagine like I mean this is obviously like the fan of me again but to have all of us form in a formation again the idea of like just being able to facilitate every single bit because I did feel like I missed a Scratch Pervert album or you know the <laughs> yeah. Beat Junkie school of right. something could have a Scratch Pervert school there's yeah. so much shit that could have been done um, that, that kind that when I when I in, within that meeting I thought oh man that's the only thing I can't you know the personalities that were there was so it was you know, there. This was like boy band level charisma. Each one of you had the thing and and contributed in different ways. And it just felt like at that point, when that went, I thought to myself, oh, I wonder how they're going to do an album now. <laughs> That's the first thing I thought. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we we were off. Me and Tony were offered a record deal by Om Records when we did the Deeper Concentration tour. Chris offered us thirty five thousand dollars and six months to live in San Francisco and make a record. But at that time, it was it was probably where we were in our personal relationships as well and where we were sort of within the kind of competition thing mm. that we it, it just felt too soon to do that because we would have had to have immersed ourselves. I mean, it could have been an incredible thing to have done, but mm. it just felt the timing just wasn't quite right because it was, you know, to be given that kind of offer was incredible. Mm. And I, I really like Chris from Om. He's a lovely guy, but we we turned it down because we were we were in the competition thing, mm. and we were so sort of dead set on that. And the idea of like making a record wasn't really on the on the agenda. We were just about battling, and that was that. And I think that was you know that's ultimately what led to that decision. And then as things have co continued, the club work became more and more of an important part of of the gig. Yeah. And we did actually have a manager in sort of from about 2004 or five. Yeah, I remember this. Um, Claudia, she was looking after us for a while, but I think she she had a vision of trying to turn us into a kind of a UK version of NERD, and it didn't quite happen. <laughs> oh, oh, in a production sense. Yeah, gotcha. yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Um, yeah, I could see that. I could see that. Um, people don't, it's, as a fan, as any fan would be, you know, you see it from a, you know, second, you're not living in the moment and it's really hard because I know that feeling when, God, can you imagine trying to navigate eight people with eight separate 
lives, eight separate skill sets, eight separate gig schedules, eight separate, and you had no management. Mm. You, you know, and someone had to steer the boat. They, they, it, whoever it could have been, it wasn't the best of managed things to even think about doing an album. That's like yeah, it was. I mean, that just impossible. wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't, and it wasn't. That wasn't what, why the crew was formed. We didn't form to make a record. We were for, we formed to, to battle. Mm. And that was what steered the boat, mm. was the competition and the fact that when you get to the tail end of the year, you're going to have the ITFs and the DMCs and you're going to do it individually and you're going to do, you know, first way did the scratch in ITF in 98. I did the scratch in ITF 99. We did the team 98. Mm. We did the team 99. It's We did the ITF team in 98. It's like it's, that was what, steered the ship mm. because you were focused on that and that alone and I, and being able to go and get larruped in a club was a bonus <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah we done gigs together too i remember that <laughs> do you remember we, was it gate crusher we did in sheffield yeah that one of them. my sushi that was what we did <laughs> that was it and i remember talking to you in the lift saying the trick for you is going to be capturing the energy you have on, on, a, on a slice mm. of wax. You remember all I know was like the joint at the yeah, time, that wasn't was it? Yeah, the Rosell yeah. record was, that would smash it mm. at the time, trying to kind of encapsulate that energy, capture it. Yeah, man. Yeah, that was a, they were some good days. Um, obviously, we've had like pretty much, I mean, bar one, which I'm still working on, uh, we have, we've had all the guys, um, Renegade, yeah. Harry, uh, uh, Mark, Mr. Thing, um, and Tony. A lot of things have been said. It's all been said. You know, there's really not a lot else to go on other than what's your what's your personal feeling? What's your any regret? What's what's your thoughts now at, at the age you are in 2020? Well, I, 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 first thing I'll say is I have an awful lot of love and respect for every person involved in in the crew. The decision that we made at the tail end of '99 was a brutal one, but one that at the time felt justified. You know, on reflection, I think it was you know it, it was a bit a bit fucking harsh um but we managed to keep going everyone managed to keep going mm -hmm. uh, in in maybe in a you know not not in a kind of battle sense the you know you look, everyone went and went on a slightly different path and everyone is still alive <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which may not have been the case if you kept on the way you was going uh. but it was yeah i, don't, I mean I, I'm, I'm not a, a regretful person i would I, I don't regret anything it's like you know it was it, it was it's something that happened a very fucking long time ago it was a long time ago. um but i'm proud of the fact that i can i spoke to harry just a few days ago we we're talking about um he's, he's looking at getting a new mixer and he's sort of, we were chatting about you know what the stuff that's on the market and what he wants to achieve and we're even like flirting with the idea of some kind of dj school thing I talk to Tony every day about his desires to buy a flat in East London. Um, Still, because he's, <laughs> I'm like his uh, his his property assistant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On a, on a regs. Cheers, Tony. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I bumped into Mark in Peckham maybe a year ago. Um, it might even be longer than that when uh, Ghost Nights were still still happening at levels. Um. And I've yeah, got a lot of love and respect for him and Ke Kev and and Paul, who I haven't seen or spoken to Paul since the split, mm -hmm. which is quite bizarre. Um, but, yeah, I would imagine if we were to meet up, everything would just you know start off from where we left off. It's kind of what I'm thinking because, you know, I know that you guys talk. I know that it's business as usual behind mm -hmm. the scenes. It's like you guys are all mates. And it's it, obviously time's healed. And it's, yeah. uh, you know, it's why we're even all able to do podcasts. Um, but I think as a punter, as, a, as somebody who's outside and doesn't actually know the ins and outs and the, 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 the weekly, monthlies, uh, would we ever see... A scratch perverts reunion reunion that's what well, everyone the, asks the, me the, the the door to my studio is always open to everyone everyone in the team yourself included in fact i think we might even yeah. be going yeah. down there it's at gonna, some time very that's soon that's actually gonna happen yeah so <laughs> yeah i mean let's see let's see if we can you know if we could do something that'd be that'd be sick do you reckon, the others yeah. are, do you reckon they'd be up for it i think everyone everyone is it's lovely to see everyone's quite busy um but it's we, we we live in a time where you can uh, you know can realize an idea and bring something to fruition quite quickly mm. 
the you know, the fact that you can share music immediately the moment mm. you've made it you can whack it on Bandcamp the, the mechanisms have changed mm. for for putting stuff out you know in, in lockdown I did this dead hand project with Mark Broom and James Ruskin mm. about these kind of techno stores two wicked wicked producers but we did it in isolation we never actually met we just send in you know music and scratching and just, made an album uh, you know and so if you can if that can be done in yeah, but it, it, but it would. Be, I would like to see. I would like to see Paul. I haven't seen him for a very, very long time. So mm. yeah, shout out to First Rate. Yeah, shout out First Rate. Um, to have an album would be incredible. Um, I'm finished business. Feels like because also you know this is coupled. Yeah, this romanticism that I'm having right now is coupled with how regularly I see you guys independently. Sure. It's coupled with I've just seen you do like a whole string of videos on your Instagram using all your analog stuff, which, oh my God, like, dude, dude, how much outboard do you need? <laughs> Killing uh, that, it. That, that was actually an old video. That was done in 2017. What? Yeah. That's a slightly slimmer and more attractive version of myself. You have got um, some mad outboard going on. and Well, uh, it, was, it was a promo for Arturia, the drum machine at the time. It was an analog machine. So um, what's the curly thing that's got? Cause just, cause, it's a tape delay. It's a tape delay? Yeah, it's just a spacer cover the top off. So you can see the snake of the analog tape. That shit's incredible. So that was, and then you you can manipulate it in real time and there was like a, a Sherman filter back. It's actually quite a kind of I think it's a fairly concise <laughs> setup, but it is a fair bit of kit. But yeah, Suresh It's like one box up, for one up, thing. Suresh, um, Suresh, hold tight. Yeah, he he had this kind of vision for the look of the whole thing. Um and it was born out of the kind of the cap down battling A-track thing where you can't really see me and it's like double moody. Yeah. Like, Let's try and capture yeah. that. We'll make it dark. and It worked. Try and make it look like a BMW Gucci advert. It fucking he, worked. He smashed it. Yeah, so we did that. That was like a, a promo thing for Arturia, but we kind of, they were really accommodating in this, the vision of like, let's make it a pure analog thing. Mm. So using that 07 Pickles edition. and, and Yeah, because that was classic. Wax. When I saw the mix, I was like, yeah, he's going back, back. <laughs> That was the quadraphonic one as well. The one was with the kind of the paddles on it. That, um, you could you could you could have a, a front and a rear output to it. It's like two mixers in in, in one case. That's cold. Bonkers, man. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, see, t- twenty seventeen. I thought you were going to say about the, uh, the 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 top down shots of looping up the things on the on that mm-hmm. Pioneer mixer. But you also doing stuff with flute box lead. Hold tight, Nathan. Oh yes, Nathan. That was of course, fantastic. Man. He was around like... yesterday, man. Yeah. It was, uh, yeah, I love working with Nathan, man. Yeah, he's yeah, a he's, wicked dude. He's energy, energy, energy. Yeah, and yeah. we're very quite similar people, so I get on like a house on fire. Yeah, and, that's my and, um, Yeah, we're trying to take it down a slightly more kind of contemporary route with the. The, the beats behind the flute and the two married together just they do yeah, yeah they do um just going back to what we were saying at the top of the the, the, the episode the, uh, well, actually more i was alluding to the the idea of like formation the splitting coming together never and still even to this day has not been done in the way that you guys did it scratch perverts did it back in the day it's more accessible now to be able to do it. Surely, like you're saying, you know, you, you've got, you've amassed, you've amassed so much equipment. You've amassed a studio. You've amassed knowledge on the technical side of things. Then every other person within the crew have their own things going on. Sure, it's, sure. It's, I mean, I feel. I mean, for for me personally, I feel like I've still got a. a I want to get some releases out um, th- this year and do some more work as mm. well, just as as, as prime cuts. I've been talking to Will Bankhead, who runs Trilogy Trilogy Tapes, one of, my, tapes. one of my favourite record labels ever. Um, we're looking to do, do do a thing together, which I'm really excited about. I sort of send him like a like a down tempo electro kind of burner tune that he's enthusiastic about. So I think we're going to do some good work. That's wicked. Um, and with the rest of the guys, man, yeah, let's 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 see if we can yeah. do something, man. Why not? I mean, me and me and Mark. We were meant to do a battle weapon together called Super Duty Tough Ones, <laughs> but we never, we just never got round to it. We're going to have K's one on the front. Uh, uh, yeah, well, that's uh, gold. But it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, but I, I think we, yeah, we're, I'm, I'm chatting with the rest of the rest of the guys, so we'll see, man. Bring it fucking on, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we won't get into too much detail that went on before the camera, but all I'll say is. A lot of dreams are coming true for you at the moment, brother. Like, it's almost like, hey, give me some of that. Touch whatever you want in here. Let it go gold. (laughs) (laughs) 
yeah, it's been a good a good week, a really good week. Yeah, trying to uh, hopefully do a sort of a, a regular slot with uh, with Huey on Radio Six BBC. Yeah, Radio you said Six, it. So be, uh, I mean, I'm d- at least doing a, 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 a kind of classic hip hop mix for for the show. Mad. Um, in the kind of guise of that hip hop don't stop. Thing. So well, Huey um, Morgan, which is what radio station? Radio Six. Radio Six. So he shows on at half ten on Saturday. It's a really good. It's a great oh, show. I listen to it. it. You know, I, I genuinely listen to it every single week. And you're already in the team. Sort of you're already part of the team. Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, that bit, Huey, when you do that, but yeah, I'll fill in for that bit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah everyone's in it. But yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. That's going to be me for the next couple of weeks and and, and building building stuff for uh, for Bankhead. Um. And yeah, let me know how you get on getting through to uh, to Paul. Yeah, how, how the lads doing? Yeah, that's the that's the next um, embarkment. I think uh, to complete the uh, set of eight. Trust me, it's a box set. <laughs> 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 and also, I, I'm, I'm going to say this now, so that we do actually do it. We are going to do a mini doc, aren't we? We have to do a scratch. Oh yeah, yeah. My, my my missus has been going through the press cuttings. Which I've kept like. I've got boxes, two huge boxes, all full of the press cuttings from yeah. 97, 98. I've got that copy of the face where we were voted DJs of the John's year. Got everything. So um, anyone out there that wants to get involved in that and help piece this whole tapestry of awesomeness together yeah. with us. That's the... Yeah, just trying to kind of put it, put, get it into some some kind of order. Mm. She's doing a really great job, so everything is chronological. She's doing so, it. For the, yeah. Oh, so at the amazing. moment we we've, we've got to. I think we've filled two books. These massive presentation books. We've filled, filled two, and we're still only in '98. I think we still. And she was saying the the press goes crazy in 2002. That's the real. That's the one where there's loads of stuff. So it'd be, it'd be uh, a great thing for me and you to go through yeah, through all that I'm stuff, done. man. And I've got some amazing photos of us in that limousine uh, going to New York in 99, man. <laughs> Actually, we, Neil told me about this. And I yeah. was like, oh, yeah, we did, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. Bonkers. <laughs> yeah, some very young faces in that car. <laughs> yeah, need that. I've got, um, I've, I've got an audio tape of the John Pill. Oh, thing. right. I've oh, got wow. it ripped as well. Big up oh, people with documents. If you could fire it. it to me, yeah, mate, that'd be Easy. amazing. I have not heard that since the show. Yeah, it's bonkers. There was like an anniversary of his passing and they sh- they played a little clip of him yeah. saying introducing us. Yeah, I've got it. Mate, I'd love that. Yeah. I've got it, I've got, got you. I've got you, say it's there. It's been converted. It's been converted, it's there. Because I knew Wicked. we were going to do this and it would be Wicked. so sick, wouldn't it? Have, Wicked. Have all these pieces all put together yeah. in, a, uh, in a timely... You know, nostalgic look at the history of the scratch. And I've, listen, I, before we sign out, I just want to say thank you. Because oh, oh, we, oh. we're there. Hey, hey. Hey. Setting fires around here again. Listen, without you and uh, your input and creative, you know, drive and belief in me from the beginning, I just definitely would not be here. Certainly wouldn't be here chat, chatting to you. So. Oh, that's, that's, that's lovely, man. Thank you that's so lovely. much, my brother. Hip hop through and through. Thank you very Joel, much. Joel, man, you know, just anybody, uh, the Hip Hop Award UK starts with this guy right I'll here. I'll try not to week. destroy your table. <laughs> Sorry, it's not a table. That's why it's... <laughs> it's just a floating... It entity. is. You know you know that Alan Partridge? <laughs> Whoa! It's that table. <laughs> Listen, thank you so much. Prime the Cuts pleasure. inside the place. Come on. Scratch thank perverts, you. yeah? Um, and if you didn't check one of the 159 shows that him, Tony and Neil did, Part Plus One did, then, yo, you missed out, man. <laughs> Until the next time, big up yourself. Bro, awesome. cut. Thanks, man. Yeah, you know what it is, Killer Cutter Podcast, sharing is caring, sharing and all that. All right, don't talk to anyone, I wouldn't. Stay lucky, people. Peace. Peace. <laughs>